In 1959, when the Soviet-made Luna 2 became the first human-made object to land on the moon, a report prepared jointly by the Pentagon's air, land, and sea forces. The paper was presented to the military commanders and the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The report, presented in a project called Horizon, proposed the establishment of a manned base by the United States to protect its interests on the moon. The base, scheduled to be completed by 1965, would be protected from the Soviet soldiers by nuclear mines, placed around the perimeter. Despite more than 60 years passing since the presentation of this project, humanity has yet to establish a permanent presence on the moon. However, things can change rapidly in the next decade. Welcome to the Spaceship Earth. In this video, we will discuss how a lunar base, which will be established in the near future, will be constructed. What considerations should be taken into account during its construction? And the lives of the people living inside it? Where should the base be established? Space, is not a suitable place for human habitation. It utilizes vacuum, sudden transitions from scorching heat to freezing cold, cosmic radiation, solar flares, and asteroids to kill. Although there have been expeditions to the moon in the past, these journeys were limited to two-week visits and posed great risks to the astronauts, who undertook the missions at the cost of their lives. The methods and systems they used were not suitable for a permanent lunar base where humans would reside for a long time. To create a safe and habitable base, it is crucial to have a good understanding of the Moon's destination. For this purpose, the lunar surface has been extensively studied through observation satellites and robots that collect and analyze soil samples. Based on these studies, the region around the Shackleton Crater, located near the lunar south pole, is considered the most suitable area for the first manned base. This region primarily has accumulated ice in the permanently shadowed areas of the craters. This ice can be collected and processed to produce oxygen for astronauts, to breathe, water for consumption, and hydrogen and oxygen as fuel for vehicles. This would significantly reduce the amount of supplies that need to be regularly sent from Earth to the Moon. Moreover, the water obtained from the craters can be used to cultivate plants in greenhouses, providing a portion of the food required by astronauts. Experiments have been conducted in the International Space Station on certain foods, such as lettuce and peppers, which can be grown quickly and with minimal maintenance. Rice cultivation is also being studied in the Chinese Space Station. Additionally, the peaks of the Shackleton Crater receive sunlight for extended periods, making them advantageous for generating the energy needed for the base through solar panels. This region, chosen as a priority target for both the Artemis program and China's manned lunar program, is suitable for the maintenance of the base, scientific research, and future commercial operations. Once the first base is established, underground lava tubes that can protect people and structures from meteoroids and radiation are considered as an ideal candidate for accommodating larger groups for longer stays. However, since this topic pertains to the subsequent stages after the initial base, we will cut it short for now. How will the first base be established? Once the decision on where to establish the manned base is made, the construction of the facility will commence. Although there is no definitive design at the moment, all the bases being developed by NASA, the European Space Agency, ESA, and China will be modular in structure. Some of these modules will be prepared on Earth and transported to the base location. Then, robots will assemble the modules to begin construction. These units will likely have inflatable bodies, providing ample working space for personnel. Both NASA and ESA are working in this field. These structures, which occupy less space during transportation and expand to their operational volume upon arrival, offer greater usable space and higher resilience with less weight compared to traditional metal structures. For instance, within the framework of the Artemis program, Sierra Space, a collaborator with NASA, aims to use a similar model to the life module it has developed. In the tests conducted, a 1 to 3 scale model of the module was subjected to an explosion test. After withstanding 13 atmospheres of pressure, the module exploded. This test confirms the durability of inflatable systems and provides confidence in their potential. After the completion of working and living areas, the next stage involves covering the base to protect it from micro-meteoroids and radiation. The visuals released for the Chinese base do not show such efforts at the moment. However, in the preliminary designs conducted by ESA and NASA, a concept stands out where lunar regolith is transformed into a type of cement using materials brought from Earth. 3D printers are also employed to utilize this lunar cement for the protection of the base against radiation and meteorite impacts, as well as constructing hangars for vehicles and barriers to prevent the scattering of regolith during landing and takeoff. During the base construction, another critical element to be prepared is the power generation center. The energy needs of the center will be met through the combined and sequential operation of multiple different systems. 
the first preferred system will be solar panels. Similar to space stations, panels with foldable structures, which occupy less space during transportation and expand to a large surface area when deployed, will be used. Contrary to what is often depicted in illustrations, these panels will be installed vertically since the base will be located at the lunar south pole. Vertical panels offer the most effective solution to maximize sunlight exposure. These panels will provide a significant portion of the energy required for the base. However, in case of lunar nights or any other reason that renders the panels ineffective, the use of micro-nuclear power plants is being considered as a backup to support the center. NASA has been working on new generation reactors for lunar missions, and deep space probes, for a long time. By combining the operation of these two main systems, the necessary energy for operating the center, will be supplied. Another important structure that needs to be built during base construction is, the landing pads. If you watch videos about moon landings, you'll see that a large amount of dust is kicked up, when the vehicles approach to the surface. When this lunar dust, also known as regolith, is examined under a microscope, it is seen to have a very sharp surface. Special precautions need to be taken to prevent these light, but sharp dust particles, which are scattered by spacecraft, from harming the vehicles, and personnel working near the base or landing area. These precautions include, the construction of at least two landing pads with a hard surface, and the installation of wind fences around these strips to capture, any amount of regolith that may be scattered. Two methods are being worked on for the construction of the landing pad. The first involves a special landing vehicle landing on a chosen smooth area, and spreading a special mixture on the surface along with the exhaust gas to create a hard runway. Maston, a company that has joined the Astrobotics, is working on this issue. Aluminum particles will be ejected from the vehicle's exhaust nozzle through a specially designed louver. The melted metal will adhere to the surface due to heat and quickly solidify, creating a hard landing area. Although this method may not be sufficient for a permanent base, it will meet the requirements before a more effective runway is developed. The second and long-term method is to prepare smooth runways using robotic construction vehicles, lunar cement, and 3D printers. With these prepared runways, spacecraft will be able to perform landing and takeoff maneuvers without endangering themselves or their surroundings. Life on the base Once the preparations are complete and the base is ready for people to come and work, the first visitors will start arriving to the center. However, the lives of the astronauts residing on the base will be different from the first humans on the moon and what we have seen in science fiction movies. Firstly, since the mission area is in the polar regions, light will predominantly come horizontally. Therefore, they will be staying in a different environment with long shadows. Living, working, and even moving in this different environment will be very different from normal. To investigate how to work in this unusual environment, NASA and ESA are starting to prepare by compiling the experiences gained in polar regions on Earth and the data obtained from experiments conducted in deep pools. Different solutions, such as reflecting the sunlight with large mirrors to make the region brighter, are being considered to facilitate the astronauts' work and life. Outside the base, astronauts working among deep shadows will end up covered in lunar dust, due to its effect, when they return from their missions. During the Apollo era, astronauts entering the lander, after their missions, saw that their suits were covered with dust. This dust also entered the vehicle, the base, and their lungs, when they took off their suits. This is a major problem for both spacesuits, the base, and the inhabitants. Currently, two different approaches are being worked on to prevent regolith from spreading everywhere. The first is an insulation method that is likely to be used in the first base. In this method, humans and living areas are completely isolated from the lunar surface. Instead of entering an airlock as seen in films or applied in space stations, astronauts attach the entry ports of their space suits to a kind of mini airlock and enter the base by exiting the suit. Since no dust can enter in this method, the center remains clean. The downside of the method is the need for a special airlock, for each space suit. And maintenance checks normally performed on the suits after each mission, cannot be carried out because the suits are in space. The other method is the active removal of lunar dust, which is better for astronauts, the base's architecture, and the suit itself but is still in the research and development stage. The basic idea behind this new method, is that even a small amount of lunar regolith carries a static charge. Based on this information, thin nanocarbon lines are woven into the outer layers of the spacesuit. Then, electricity is passed through these lines at specific levels, creating a magnetic field that repels the charged dust particles away from the suit. Tests conducted so far have shown that, a suit prepared in this way can remove 95% to 97% of the dust that adheres to it. If the design being worked on, can be applied to the suits made by Axiom Space. The lifespan of the suits can be extended from tens of hours to hundreds of hours. Additionally, since most of the dust that adheres to the suit can be removed, 
classic airlocks can be used in station architecture. Other ideas, such as using this method on vehicles, and even the base itself, are also being discussed. Although, space suits are suitable for the moon and methods of keeping people away from dust are being clarified, a large portion of the work on the lunar surface will be carried out by robots. In addition to wheeled rovers, long-range research robots equipped with jumping motors will be able to explore a large area around the base without departing from it. To achieve this, the base needs to have a comprehensive communication system. Satellite internet systems, similar to Starlink, to be established in lunar orbit, and lunar GPS systems will provide the necessary connectivity for vehicles and traveling robots to determine their location. There is still some time ahead for organizing the mentioned work and having them ready at least at a minimum level. The earliest modules of a permanent lunar base are planned to be landed on the moon in 2028. Considering the flexibility in the Artemis and Chinese lunar programs, we can expect the first lunar base to become operational in the 2030s. Apart from these preparations we discussed, there are many obstacles to overcome and problems to be solved. However, these are topics for another video. The moon is our closest neighbor in the vast universe. Moving there is the first step we need to take to go further develop ourselves, and be able to travel between planets and even to interstellar destinations. When we start going to the moon regularly, and start collecting and utilizing its resources, it will be a historic era, and a stepping stone for space exploration, the Earth, and humanity. We hope that, the day when our dreams come true, will come as soon as possible. Thank you for watching the Spacecraft Earth. If you found our video helpful, please like and share. Subscribe to our channel to not miss our videos about space and space technologies.